Hi, this is Carl A. Opson at the University of Arizona, and I'm going to walk you through some of the basics of special education, just so that we're all on the same page. This is going to be a review for some of you, but uh, repetition is certainly a, a great way to build long-term memory, so you might want to sit through anyways. This is a presentation that was created by the NICHCY Center. They're no longer in existence. All of the materials have moved over to parentcenterhub.org. Great resource that we'll use throughout the course. But it's a, a federal site, and so I know that their information is accurate or they wouldn't leave it out there. And uh, while I have some of my own opinions about special education in the process that we'll talk about and read about during the course, this is a, a great piece that shows specifically the elements and the basics of special education to get us all on the same page. So this module looks at uh, 10 steps in the special education process. Some acronyms that we should know in special education, although there are many, many others, and some, some really key terms. We'll talk about the 10 steps in the initial process of special education. And there are many other procedural issues that go on and issues within each step. But broadly defined, the 10 are first a child is identified for needing special education and related services, um, usually by a teacher, but it could be by anyone. Um, these days there are a lot of parents that make requests for their children to be evaluated for special education services. The second thing that happens, and there are lots, of, actually lots of steps in between, but the child is evaluated for services. Um, a step in between here is that there's a requirement that other services are tried first, or that the school have a team to make sure that the general education process has been implemented appropriately first. But then the child is evaluated for special education services, After the assessment is done for eligibility, then eligibility is decided, whether or not a child is considered a child <clears throat> with a disability, which is a very specific designation that we'll also read about later on in the semester. Parents and even the student are part of the group that decides eligibility. But it's also going to include um, well, who do you think it's going to include? That's right, it's going to include a special education teacher, probably going to include the, the administrator for the school, the principal or assistant principal, a school psychologist or someone who can, uh, who can interpret the assessment results, some general education teachers, and then, of course, the special education teacher and the parent and the child, if appropriate. The thing about that is, if you're the special education teacher, you're responsible for getting all those people together. So that's why I say there are many issues surrounding this. There's a, a small pile of paperwork to create to get the assessment and the eligibility determined. And if a child is found eligible for services at step four, then a meeting is scheduled to develop the individualized education plan. We'll talk more about what that is in just a minute. Then the IEP meeting is held and the IEP is written. Actually, much of this is done behind the scenes before the meeting is ever really held. The special education teacher should have a pretty good idea and have floated some ideas of goals and objectives that will go in the IEP and related services so that the meeting goes smoothly. Then services are provided and there are regulations and terms around services provided. Um, children are to receive through the IEP, it's documented in the IEP, a certain number of minutes of services each week. And you have to keep track of that, you have to make sure it happens, and that's 
a little more depth in terms of services are provided. Another thing that you have to keep track of as a special education teacher is measuring progress on the IEP. We don't just write it and put it in a drawer. We actually have to keep track of how students are performing. And that's going to become even more important these days because the federal government has refocused from just evaluating whether or not we have met due process and paperwork guidelines appropriately to whether or not students are making progress. And in this course, when we learn how to write IEP goals, the first thing I'm going to tell you is don't write a goal you can't measure. Always think about measurement as you're writing the goal. IEPs are reviewed at least once a year there's an IEP meeting. So you keep a caseload of students and you follow up on them with another meeting of that same group that developed the IEP to take a look at whether or not there need to be adjustments. And then every three years the group considers whether or not the whole IEP needs to be written and a new assessment needs to be done. That was one of the amendments that was included in special education law and regulations used to be when I was teaching that every three years you just did a full reassessment. Now the team can determine what assessments need to be done or whether any need to be done at all. So step 10 is the child is reevaluated and that could happen every three years. Now let's talk about some acronyms. And this is, this presentation gets a little goofy. It's not my presentation. Um, but as I said, this is a federal presentation and it's good information and I know it's accurate. One of the things you need to remember is that IDEA means Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's our special education law. Right? It's the, the federal law that creates agreements with states for states to receive funding for students to serve students with disabilities. So if states agree to serve students with disabilities, they receive funding. All states agree to receive funding for students with disabilities. FAPE. You're going to hear the word FAPE. We need to provide FAPE. Why isn't this child receiving FAPE? Um, FAPE is a, one of the central tenets of the IDEA, even though it's not written into the law exactly. It's a term that kind of grew after IDEA. And it means that states must make a free, appropriate public education available to all children with disabilities. Remember, general ed kids do not have a federal right to a free appropriate public education. Their education is governed by state constitutions. But students with disabilities, if a child is identified as a student with disability, they come under IDEA and the federal government ensures that the states actually provide services to all kids with children with the children with disabilities. So by free, what do they mean? They mean that kids don't have to pay extra or parents don't have to pay extra for special education teachers, for specially designed instruction. They don't pay for the assessments. They don't pay for the meetings. Um, they don't even have to pay for copies if they want copies made of the child's records or IEP. Um, there are things that parents do have to pay for. Um, they have to pay for things that any other child would be responsible for paying for. Um, an example I'll use later in class is an art class where a teacher says that every child is responsible for 
purchasing and bringing to the classroom five canvases to use during art. A parent may suggest that since their child is a child with a disability, they're to receive a free appropriate public education and so all those canvases should be paid for. That's not true. Um, they are responsible for providing for their child the elements of the education that every other child has to pay for in a school. Appropriate means designed individually for the child and that's where the IEP comes in. Public has to do with the fact that this is a federal law and it's a federal agreement between states and public schools and charter schools not private schools. So private schools are not responsible for providing services to children with disabilities through IDEA neither can they draw money from the federal government for the students they serve in the way that the states can. However, public schools or private schools can take advantage of the services provided by the public schools. So if they have a child with a disability that needs specific services, they can contract with a nearby school to provide those services to that child in the private school through the public school. And education, it seems ridiculous to bring that up here, that it's part of the FAPE acronym, but we have to consider defining education broadly, that it means not only academics, but social and life education, right? readiness for career. Now let's take a look at a few acronyms. The first one is the IEP, Individualized Education Program. Every child in public school with a disability receiving funds through IDEA has to have an IEP. And it's the responsibility of the special education teacher to make sure that it is written appropriately um, and followed and that progress measurements are made according to the goals that are on the IEP and that related services are provided as necessary. I'm not sure what this slide was meant to denote, whether it was paperwork requirements and regulations or the place within the law where the IEP is defined. But we'll just move on from that. Five things about an IEP. It's individualized. You can't take one IEP and say, we've got a child with autism, we'll just take this child's IEP and we'll make it useful for another child with autism. Every child's an individual, every situation is individual, and the IEP has to be written for the individual goals and needs of that child. And it's a written plan. Okay, it's not just a verbal agreement. It's a written plan for the child's education broadly. Social, academic, life skills, career skills, transition to adulthood. It's written by parents and school staff together. So the, the parents don't come in and shouldn't just come in and have an IEP tossed at them or just be told what's happening. However, you know, parents don't have a lot of a lot of uh, experience in special education. And so it's incumbent upon school staff to make parents comfortable in this situation and to incorporate their input. So it lists special education and more. So there's a lot in an IEP. We'll look at exactly what's included in the IEP. It's a bit of a, a lengthy document. Um, it includes the minutes served, related services, and a range of other things.
And I guess they want to make the point in this slide that that IEP planning it, it results in a document, but it's also a process, and it's a process that's embedded within the procedural safeguards that allow us to provide FAPE, a free appropriate public education, for children with disabilities. LRE is something we'll talk about in detail in another class session, but here I'll tell you that it means a child with disability is expected to be educated to the maximum extent appropriate with kids who don't have disabilities. Now that's to the maximum extent appropriate. It might be appropriate for a child to be in a general education classroom. It might be more appropriate for a child to be in the gen ed classroom with some support services. It might be more appropriate for that child to leave certain times of the day to receive specialized ser related services or educational services. And it might be appropriate for that child to be in a separate classroom or resource classroom. LRE doesn't necessarily mean a fully inclusive education. It means that we choose the best place for the child to be successful in their education. And I think the feds wanted us to see that the, there is help available through technical assistance and dissemination networks um, like Parent Center Hub and the National Center for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. And it certainly is true that there are many acronyms for these resource centers and for all of the procedures that go on in special education. So we've looked at 10 basic steps in the special education process. We've begun to talk about some acronyms. We'll read more about them. Um, hopefully they'll be ingrained in your memory. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again online. Come back and we'll talk more about special education for kids with disabilities and the procedural and legal requirements throughout the semester.